Hello everyone, happy Darwin Day. We've all heard of Origin of Species and Descent of Man, but Charles Darwin wrote a lot of other books that get substantially less coverage. We're going to talk about those today, so let's jump right in. As we discussed in our video, Darwin's Evidence, a young Charles Darwin took a journal with him as he circumnavigated the globe from 1831 to 1836. As we know, Darwin visited South America, the Falkland Islands, the Galapagos Islands, the Cocos Islands, Tahiti, New Zealand, Australia, Mauritius, and South Africa, among other places. All along the way, he gathered rocks, fossils, and biological specimens that would later be evaluated some of which he would use to build the first version of the theory of evolution. Darwin published his journal in 1839 under the title The Voyage of the Beagle, and if you haven't read it, you really should. It was a great success for Darwin at the time, and even nearly two centuries later, it's quite fascinating. In 1842, Darwin published The Structure and Distribution of Coral Reefs being the first part of the geology of the Voyage of the Beagle under the command of Captain Fitzroy R.N. during the years 1832 to 1836, in which he founded the new, and still used, though with some modifications, paradigm for understanding how coral reefs form. The old paradigm, championed by geologist Charles Lyell, argued that coral reefs rose up from extinct volcanoes. Darwin flipped this idea on its head. While at the Cocos Islands and Tahiti, Darwin realized that corals only grow in warm, shallow water. All the corals below a certain point were dead. Thus, Darwin reasoned that corals couldn't have risen up from the cold, deep water. They must have been growing on the volcano in the shallow region as it sank. The corals continued to reach upwards, with the new generations recruiting atop old ones, staying in the optimal zone. It is interesting that Darwin figured out this series of events since the theory of plate tectonics wouldn't be realized until the next century. Darwin even managed to convince Lyell of this new idea, helping to solidify Darwin's scientific reputation well before he published on evolution. In 1844, Darwin published Geological Observations on the Volcanic Islands visited during the voyage of HMS Beagle, in which he discussed geological observations he made at the Cape Verde Archipelago, Fernando de Nerona Archipelago, Tahiti, Mauritius, Ascension Island, St. Helena, the Galapagos Islands, New Zealand, and others. One of the important discoveries in this book is that magma undergoes chemical changes from melt to eruption, a process called igneous differentiation. Darwin was one of the first naturalists to discuss this process, though of course much more is known about it today. In 1846, Darwin published Geological Observations on South America, in which Darwin discusses the geology and paleontology of South America. Remember from our video in Evolving Understanding that Darwin added immensely to the fossil fauna of South America. However, regarding his book, he later caustically wrote, Quote, geologists never read each other's work, and that the only object in writing a book is a proof of earnestness, and that you do not form your own opinions without undergoing labor of some kind. Close quote. <laughs> Prior to his voyage, only two fossil species were known from South America, and Darwin's discoveries were majorly important to his later formulation of the theory of evolution. Though Darwin found numerous fossils of giant extinct mammals, he also found some spectacular plant fossils. For example, on the banks of the Parana River in northern Argentina, Darwin came across petrified wood alongside fossil sharks' teeth and oyster shells, which researchers have identified as being 10 to 15 million years old. While Darwin was circumnavigating the world, in April 1835, Darwin found a petrified forest belonging to the 235 million year old Agua de la Zora Formation, which hails from the Cuyo Basin of Mendoza Province, Argentina. He wrote in his journal, quote, I was gratified in a very extraordinary manner, close quote. The petrified wood belongs to the genus Agathoxylon, which is a member of the family Araucariaceae. Today, the area is known as Darwin's Forest, and much more paleobotanical research has been done since. The forest was evidently subtropical, with an upper stratum dominated by the giant tree-like fern, Cunia mixalon, a second stratum of the conifer, 
Arau Carioxalon, and the understory of the much smaller fern, Clydophlebis. 21 total plant taxa have been documented from Darwin's forest, including the horsetail, Neocalamides, the fern, Dicroidium, and the ginkgo, Sphenobiera. The discovery of fossil mammals and Darwin's forest alone already cemented Darwin's reputation as a celebrity scientist. From the very start, he was a diligent and hard-working naturalist, so it's no wonder that he would radically transform biology. In 1851, Darwin published his first two books on barnacles, a monograph on the subclass Cirripedia with figures of all the species, the Lepetidae or pedunculated cirripedes, and a monograph on the fossil Lepetidae or pedunculated cirripedes of Great Britain. Darwin published a third book on barnacles in 1854, a monograph on the subclass Cirripedia with figures of all the species, the Volanidae or sessile cirripedes, the Verusidae, etc., and a fourth book on barnacles in 1855, a monograph on the fossil Volanidae and Verusidae of Great Britain. Darwin began studying barnacles in part because he wanted to apply his knowledge of evolution to a well-known group of organisms, whose inclination to attach to the hulls of ships was a practical relevance to a seafaring nation like Britain. Though they were easily accessible, the details of their biology were not well understood, and Darwin's scientific associates approved of his work in this area as a way to further establish his reputation. What started out as a short-term project escalated into a multi-year effort that ended up a landmark of research. Lepetidae is a family of goose barnacles erected by Darwin that contains three genera, Lepus, Conchoderma, and Docema. Darwin entered the debate on barnacles when naturalists were still trying to nail down their exact placement. Previously, naturalists, including Baron George Cuvier, generally considered barnacles to be mollusks, a fact which surprised Darwin. Darwin, though, looked at the internal anatomy of barnacles and noticed numerous similarities, homologies, with stomatopod crustaceans, a group that includes the mantis shrimp. Some earlier naturalists, such as Vaughn Thompson in 1830, had suggested that barnacles were crustaceans due to the similarity between their larvae and that of crustacean larvae, the so-called cyprid stage. Darwin intimately detailed the anatomy of barnacles, and as for their fossils, Darwin noted that there is considerable variation both within and between species. Remember that such variation is essential to evolution. In the case of the Cretaceous stalked barnacle Scalpellum arcuatum, Darwin observed that the species differed slightly from the early to late Cretaceous, which indicated to Darwin that the species had changed over time. Darwin had all the pieces. His knowledge of evolution grew gradually over time. Organisms replace others both in space and time, limited resources exist in the environment, which organisms have to compete over, and organisms have variations that make them better or worse at existing in an environment. Technically, none of these were new observations. Naturalists already had all the pieces. It just took someone observant to put them together. As we all know, On the Origin of Species was published in 1859, but we covered that in Darwin's Evidence. In 1862, Darwin published On the Various Contravances by which British and Foreign Orchids are Fertilized by Insects and On the Good Effects of Intercrossing. Darwin briefly mentions interactions between plants and insects in origin, but in his new book, Darwin tackles in full how coevolution has shaped both clades. It also helps that growing exotic orchids was quite popular at the time, similar to his pigeon breeding hobby, which provided Darwin with a first-hand demonstration of the power of artificial selection. It is in his orchid book that Darwin, mesmerized by the stunning weirdness of the Madagascan orchid, Angraecum sesquipedale, predicted that a moth with a spectacularly long proboscis must exist to be able to pollinate the orchid. Of course, creationists, never missing an opportunity to shoot their mouths off, such as George Campbell, 8th Duke of Argyll, ridiculed this prediction as a, quote, most unsatisfactory conjecture, close quote, and asserted that the extremely long nectary was created specifically by God for reasons... As we discussed in Evolutionary Predictions, that long proboscis moth was discovered, Xanthopan morgani, vindicating Darwin's coevolutionary theory. As it happens, orchids have a huge variety of methods for attracting pollinators. For example, the bee orchid looks like a bee. A bunch of orchids have species-specific scents that mimic female wasps. Spiranthes is pollinated by bumblebees that move 
from the mature flowers at the bottom to the youngest flowers at the top. Catacetum actually launches its pollen sac, and there are numerous others. In 1868, Darwin published The Variations of Animals and Plants Under Domestication. This book has two main functions. It describes morphological variations among domesticated organisms and lays out Darwin's idea of pangenesis. As previously mentioned, Darwin bred pigeons, so he writes extensively about them here. He also discusses the origins of dogs, cats, horses, cattle, pigs, and others. In the same way that the gray wolf, Canis lupus, is the progenitor of house dogs, the rock pigeon, Columba livia, is the ancestral stock from which domesticated pigeons are derived. As for pangenesis, this was how Darwin tackled what was, at the time, a complete mystery. How variations are transmitted through generations. His pangenesis idea states that organic molecules called gemules from each body system accumulate in the gametes. Of course, Darwin lived long before DNA was known to be the molecule of inheritance, and thus long before anyone knew what mutations or genes were. As it happens, Gregor Mendel was working around the same time as Darwin, and though we know Mendel read Origin of Species and was influenced by it, Darwin seems to have only read a German summary of Mendel's work. Sadly, Darwin's German and his mathematical abilities weren't that good, so he didn't fully grasp the significance of Mendel's results. Ironically, both Darwin and co-discoverer of natural selection, Alfred Russell Wallace, got ratios for the distribution of certain alleles in primroses and butterflies, respectively, that independently confirmed Mendel's results. Darwin and Wallace wrote to each other about this interesting phenomenon, but they never realized what it meant. Imagine what they might have accomplished had they been able to share information as quickly as we do today on the internet. On an anthropological kick, the Scent of Man was published in 1870, and the expression of the emotions in man and animals was published in 1872. Darwin suggests in Origin that, quote, much light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history, close quote. And indeed, Darwin did exactly that. Descent roots humans firmly among the great apes, while expression compares the emotions of humans to animals. Humorously, Darwin, unlike Thomas Henry Huxley and his supporters, was not a firebrand. He knew the impact his works would have on the average person. Most people were pretty uncomfortable being compared to animals then and now. But Darwin also knew that he had a pretty substantial body of facts supporting his position. Then Darwin turned to botany, publishing six books on the subject in total. In 1875, Darwin published On the Movements and Habits of Climbing Plants and Insectivorous Plants. The former discusses vine plants and how they are able to climb. Darwin also discusses the fact that many plants grow in a spiral pattern rather than straight, a process called circumnutation. Darwin argues that all plant movement adaptations, such as gravitropism and nyctinasty, are modifications of circumnutation. For reference, gravitropism is a plant growth in response to gravity. Roots display positive gravitropism by growing towards the direction of gravitational pull, while stems display negative gravitropism by growing away from the direction of gravitational pull. On the other hand, nyctinasty is the process by which some plants retract their leaves or flower petals at night. Darwin hypothesizes that the various types of plant movements have evolved in response to particular environmental pressures. For example, maybe growing winding tendrils that hook onto other plants was originally useful in a very windy environment. Insectivorous plants focuses on the adaptations of certain plants to carnivory. Carnivorous plants tend to evolve in localities that are very nutrient-poor soils. Thus, consuming insects and other invertebrates is a way to supplement their, erm, diets. Darwin also observed that carnivorous plants don't respond to just anything, like rain or wind blowing leaves against them, but only to stimuli that feel like an insect. Further, he explores that Carnivorous plants have adapted their prey capturing methods from pre-existing structures, and that other closely related carnivorous plants may adapt in totally different directions, such as Pinguicula and Utricularia. In 1876, Darwin published The Effects of Cross and Self-Fertilization in the Vegetable Kingdom, which extensively documents the harmful effects of continued inbreeding in plants. In 1877, Darwin published The Different Forms of Flowers on Plants of the Same Species, one of the major topics in this book is heterostyly, 
Understand that within a species of angiosperm, not all the flowers are equal in the proportions of their organs, such as the style or stamen. Some flowers exist in morphs, such as Primula varus, in which one morph has a long style, but short stamen, and another has a short style, but long stamen. The reason for these morphs is probably to promote outcrossing. For example, a butterfly would collect pollen from a long stamen flower, and then transfer that pollen to a long style flower. Darwin's experiments demonstrated that a flower, crossed with a morph of the opposite type, produced more seeds, as opposed to flowers crossed with morphs of the same type. In 1880, Darwin published The Power of Movement in Plants, in which he further discusses circumnutation, gravitropism, phototropism, and sensitivity to touch, called thigmatropism. And in 1881, Darwin published his final book, The Formation of Vegetable Mold Through the Action of Worms, in which he discusses the behavior and ecology of earthworms. I actually first learned about this book by reading Anthony Martin's book, The Evolution Underground, which concerns both modern and fossil burrows. In the case of earthworms, Darwin observed that they can move an immense amount of soil in a relatively short time. So, those are Darwin's lesser-known books. Darwin wrote an immense number of books over his lifetime on subjects from geology to zoology to botany. He forever transformed both the public and scientific understanding of these fields, providing reams of evidence for the old age of the earth and the constant action of natural selection. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.